So for the sake of time, I'm just uh, going to start wrapping things up. What I'd like to do is uh, maybe go across the panel and just have uh, uh, your 10-second soundbite key point. Uh, <laughs> Don, you're it. <laughs> do you want to start us off? Uh, <laughs> 10 seconds? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what's the key message that you'd like to... So, uh, so my key message is that uh, open source is not in and of itself some, some magic solution. It's a it's a tool that businesses can use to lower their costs, increase their revenues, and increase their agility, and therefore their multiple. That's a good point, Mike. I think thinking about open source as a community, and uh, I've been really impressed at, at the, the Drupal community and, and the, the, the genuine nature of it. That some, the people and the egos involved really do matter, and, and sort of having an assessment of who's who's behind there and how the community feels is, is, is really uh, important in terms of assessing tools. Dave? Um, I think just keep in mind that uh, open source is a real phenomenon. It's still very young and new. Mm -hmm. um, really, this all got started when internet communi communications became mm -hmm. viable in terms of a big way. And uh, before that, the idea of a distributed community from various organizations, commercial, government, NGOs, being able to collaborate and work together around the world um, without any money necessarily being tied to it uh, is inconceivable. And so um, that's what changed when internet communications essentially brought that communication free. So remember, this is still a very young and early phenomenon. Yeah. All the things we're talking about here, why is it not being used, procurement, legal issues, all these things yeah. are a result of the fact that yeah. it's new. Yeah. This is a disruptive force going through, and whether you're a business or whether you're buying stuff, or, you, or whether you're a software provider, or uh, whatever your pro part of that IT process is involved, we're all trying to figure out how to change to make sure to figure out the most efficient, effective way to use this stuff. And um, that means that in 10 years from now, the conversation we're going to have about open source is radically different than one today. Sean. Uh, well, I think the first thing is uh, anybody would have to look at their organization and say, and, and, and see if they are just a, a user of technology or a contributor to technology. If you're just a user to technology, really what you're going for is value, mm -hmm. uh, because IT is a cost to you to run your business, which is a totally different perspective than somebody who is into uh, uh, in the business of technology. Uh, and then what they have to look at is their, their business model for what they want to do uh, and whether they really have a big benefit in working with the open source community or if the proprietary model with uh, uh, all, the, uh, you know, all that comes with it is really the, the best model for, for, for their business model. Right. Yeah, picking up on that and Dave's point about um, how new it is and how important the internet was, um, you know, let's not forget that the, the sort of fundamental standard that allowed the internet to take place was you know, TCP IP back in the 70s. Uh, so uh, some people in this room, actually I'm not sure they were around back then, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, this was a standard that the U.S. Department of Defense came out with and said, IBM, Burroughs, you know, the, the bunch or that were back there, you will allow your computers to talk to each other on this protocol. I worked one of these big, ugly uh, computer companies at the time, and it was interesting. I mean, the power of the government buyer, and I was actually working with a company called Shell, who were very big on open standards, and they insisted that IBM adopt this protocol into its, you know, key boxes, right? And so, you know, there is a role for big buyers, and government is among the big buyers, to drive open standards, and that can drive competition, and open source is part of that. So that's kind of, I think, uh, an important piece. Just the other thing was, it mentioned a couple of times here, one of the great things about open source is it really drives local growth and jobs and local entrepreneurship, right? As opposed to the sort of dead hand of licensing where revenue is extracted out of a place and sent to some, you know, we'll say this foreign country. Um, and um, uh, where they speak with funny accents. Um, and <laughs> I can say that, right? <laughs> So, and you know this whole notion that it's about it's about services, it's about people, it's about people adding value. Uh, I hear this around the world. I hear this in France. I hear this in other countries around the world. And the notion that it can um, enable uh, ease of entry for small and medium enterprises. And there is a little bit of industrial policy around this. And, and uh, I don't think that you know something we didn't talk about earlier. I don't think that should lead to a mandate for open source.
us. Um, we're not a big believer in mandates. You've got to look at value for money. You've got to look at uh, uh, pros and cons. But I think in a very important way, what you see in this area, it's a lot of healthy software entrepreneurs. And I think Dave's example earlier showed, I mean, a lot of those companies just couldn't exist without the power to get started on top of open source. So I think it's very, very exciting. Which gets back to the comment about capitalism, pro-capitalism. Yeah, you don't have to be a capitalist, but if you are, it's a great way to go. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.